So thank you for coming this evening for what I think is a hugely important conversation um, uh, on the Public Order Bill and uh, the implications of the Public Order Bill for some of our, for some of our most important uh, freedoms and, and liberties. Um, it's, it's a debate that we need to have, but it's actually a debate that I think is largely just being ignored. And one of the points of tonight was to make sure that you try to put it on the agenda. But the fact that this room is not full with 120 people in it is actually a sign of how this incredibly important debate for our society is just being sort of rolling on by, which I think is shocking, which is why we're recording tonight and we'll put it online. We invited media. They're not here. But, you know, you're here, which is fantastic. So thank you for coming. Um, uh, we've got three uh, 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 amazing speakers tonight, all of whom will speak for about 10 minutes. We've got Baroness Chami Chakrabarti, who you will know well as former director of uh, Liberty, former uh, 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 Shadow Attorney General until 2020. Thank you for coming, Chami. We've got Stephanie Harrison KC, uh, one of the country's leading protest lawyers. And we've got uh, Lord Hope of uh, Craighead, who's a former justice uh, of uh, the Supreme Court. Um, each of them have got 10 minutes. Uh, uh, we'll start uh, uh, with, with, with Shami, uh, and then we'll go to Lord Hope, and then we'll come to you, Stephanie. Okay, so uh, Shami, over to you. So I'm going to do this without using a mobile phone as a clock, because we use our mobile phones for everything. It's too, it's too much. So there's, a, there's a clock there. I'm wearing I'll, my phone. I'll let you know with two minutes to go. And, and I've got an old fashioned watch. It doesn't tell me when to get up in the morning, or do I can't talk to anybody. It's, this is what watch used to look like. Um, it's a huge privilege to be here, um, and a slightly daunting one because um, I'm here with two very fine legal minds. Um, you know, a former law lord and the leading silk on protest law in this country. My career has been slightly, uh, slightly different from from these great barristers and and, um, and legal minds. Do come and sit down, and there's some seats at the front as well. Um, this is quite an intimate group um, because apparently people are going to other things to do with making lots of money. Um, so um, um, this bit is important because it probably explains where I'm coming from. Um, in my um, career in the law, um, I was a lawyer in the Home Office for some years. So that's the same government department. For those of you that are international, uh, students, that's um, a bit like the Ministry of the Interior in, 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 in some countries, that's Homeland Security, uh, a bit of justice. Um, so I worked there for nearly six years and that was probably the most formative part of my career. And I worked on things like criminal justice legislation and immigration legislation um, and public order legislation and I have some sense of how things can develop and how departments can develop cultures, and also how, over time, um, tendencies can develop, and some legislation is almost produced by a, a kind of intellectual copy and paste. Um, after that period, I went to work for an organisation called Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties, and again for international um, students. That's a, that sort of um, our equivalent in this country to the ACLU in the United States. We are the sort of slightly younger, much poorer, smaller cousin of the, of the ACLU, and we have much solidarity and cooperation, particularly during the war on terror. Um, and, and, and I was director of that organization for some years. And then, you know, after that, I came into, I came into a parliament in the House of Lords. Now, why that is important is that the Home Office produces a lot of legislation, a lot of legislation full stop. And in my adult lifetime, political parties, I happen to be in the Labour Party, but political parties and governments of both stripes have spent many years involved in what I call an authoritarian arms race, where your home affairs legislation is, is a big part of your electioneering. And we've been, those of you that are interested in British politics will have been reading, for example, in recent days, stories that um, the current government might try to fight the next election on the issue of small boats in the English Channel and pulling out of the Convention on Human Rights. Now, this trajectory actually began, in my view, in the 1990s, 
when two men um, were initially the home affairs spokespeople for their parties and then came to lead their parties. And those two men were um, somebody called Tony Blair and somebody called Michael Howard. Now, Lord Howard of Lympton, who actually uh, voted in the Labour content lobby on an important amendment last night. Now, what I would say about uh, the Public Order Bill is that it is an example of intellectual copy and paste from um, anti-terror legislation. And some of the most um, horrific anti-terror legislation of, 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 of my career and my adult life did things like increase, one, stop and search powers without even suspicion that the person you're stopping and searching has done anything or is about to do anything. So you take blanket powers to designate an area. Um, back in the day, uh, under anti-terror laws, the whole of the Greater London metropolitan area was once designated for stop and search without suspicion because area hadn't been defined in the Terrorism Act of 2000. So one feature of anti-terror legislation has been, and to some extent knife crime legislation has been, let's increase stop and search powers. It's a very, very blunt instrument, and some of you will know how toxic that can be for relationships between the police and the community they're supposed to serve. Another feature of the Public Order Bill, again taken from, um, taken from anti-terror legislation, almost with copy and paste, um, is, um, is banning orders. So, um, including without criminal conviction. And this, to me, is something that has morphed from, and, and now we're banning you from protest, but this has morphed from various powers that we've had in, uh, over the years. Uh, in the terror context, it was um, control orders, where you could be under house arrest without even a criminal charge. Uh, and prior to that, again, I'm sorry to say, you know, Labour governments experimented with antisocial behaviour orders. And what we're doing here is we are blending um, or we are blurring the lines between criminal due process civil process and even administrative administrative law or essentially executive executive decision making without proper um, due process let alone the rolls voice due process that is supposed to come when very serious things are going to happen to you particularly with a, a criminal outcome for you and now we're doing this not even in the name of fighting terrorism which was of course in since post 9 11 people said we have to blur these lines because, the, the, because of the threat from terrorism. Now, we're doing this in relation to um, just a protest. And by definition, we're talking, uh, the argument is that some peaceful dissent is so disruptive that we're now gonna treat that in the way that previously we treated suspected terrorists. And so those are sort of three elements of what's awful about the bill. But, Stephanie will be able to, to talk to you a little bit about another element, which is giving the Secretary of State, the Home Secretary, specific powers to seek injunctions um, to stand in the place of presumably Rupert Murdoch if his, if his print presses are being, are being protested against, or perhaps the, um, perhaps the um, Shell. Shell BP. Or what about Ofgem? Or what about you know, these companies that have been marching into people's homes and um, breaking into people's homes with a, a, a rubber stamped court order to, um, to um, place the uh, prepay gas meters and fuel meters. You know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of aspects of um, disputes between people that should, in my view, be left to the civil law. And, you know, um, and that's your class, including nuisance. And, you know, there is a lot of nuisance. I live in central London, you study in central London, sometimes there's a hell of a lot of noise. We, we live in a building site, and some of that is really annoying. And we are now, if we're not careful, gonna to get to a point where it's easier to arrest somebody for peaceful dissent, because it's loud, because it's disruptive, because it's annoying, it's gonna be easier to arrest someone for protesting against the uh, the building work or the fossil fuel development than it is to sue sue your neighbour for you know for nuisance and 
But one of the arguments that um, um, uh, an interesting thing about this panel tonight is that Lord, Lord Hope and I disagreed about some aspects of the bill, and we agree, and we agreed about others. And in some crucial debates last week and, and, and last night, we were we, you know we, we were on different sides. But I do think it's a shame there aren't more people here. I hope some more people will, will watch in due course because this blurring of the lines between what should be in the hands of the executive, what should be a matter for disputes between between um, citizens in the civil courts, and what should be a matter not just of criminal law but quasi anti terror law. You know, this is very important. This is this is the rule of law. Not it, and this is, fundam this is fundamental rights and freedoms. And why it's so important, of course, right now, is there are going to be more protests, whether you like it or not. Given the levels of inequality in this country and in the world, given um, you know, the, the reawakening of the Black Lives Matter movement, given climate catastrophe, there is going to be more disagreement. And there isn't a way to disagree well and tolerate some peaceful dissent when people feel they don't have an adequate voice in the big media, um, in Parliament. If they don't have a space to go sometimes and be a bit of a nuisance, and they, of course there are, there are balances to be struck, and some direct action will always intentionally break the traditional criminal law. And one of my big, I will stop in a moment, one of my biggest beefs about the public order bill is that I don't believe it was necessary at all. And if I'm wrong about that, how come this has been possible for so many people to be arrested and prosecuted um, under the existing law in recent times, including a large number of journalists, which is why one of the uh, amendments that we passed last night with Lord Hope's um, help was an amendment to avoid, to, to prevent the use of any police power for the primary purpose of preventing a person um, observing or otherwise reporting on, uh, on a protest. And that is for journalists with their press cards, but it's also for legal observers, it's also for bystanders who happen to see what's going on and record it on their mobile phone. So that was one uh, victory of some others we had last night, but, um, but the, the battle continues because this bill will in due course go back to the House of Commons and we'll have the, the toing and throwing that goes on from there. Thank you, Sharon. Well, good evening, everybody. I start from a rather different position from Shami because um, I spent my career, first of all, at the bar, at the Scottish bar. And I have to say, when I began my training, nobody had thought about human rights at all. And I don't remember the subject ever cropping up in my entire legal training. <coughs> the convention is in 1951, and I started my studies in 1962 and it still wasn't mentioned then, it wasn't mentioned when I left, and really it wasn't until the Human Rights Act came along that the whole thing became uh, obvious to us how much we'd been missing and how important it was. I was uh, actually on the Scottish bench to begin with, and um, I actually had to, I actually set aside a judgment which said we couldn't refer to the Human Rights Act, to, to the convention, I should say, because it was not made part of our law. And the judge had said, it's not part of our law, and I said, that's quite wrong that we should be able to look at it, and uh, that started the, the, the movement to look at it. But of course, we, the Human Rights Act changed everything completely. There was another aspect of our law which was not taught to us at all, which was EU law. Um, and it's quite extraordinary in my career. I had to learn all these things as I went along, uh, and gradually, and Shani has played a part in, in my career at, at long distance in a way, because she's brought cases before us and, and uh, come as a, an intervener before us uh, from her perspective, which was informed our thinking. I spent um, 17 years uh, as a law lord or on the Supreme Court dealing with uh, cases which to begin with didn't have very much human rights involvement. But we, we did strike a very important blow uh, against the, um, uh, the Labour government of uh, Tony Blair uh, in a case called the, uh, the Belmarsh case. Now, I don't know whether you, you know about that, but that was when an, an order was pronounced which subjected uh, suspected terrorists to indefinite intention, in detention, I should say, without trial. Now, um, of course, that itself was objectionable, 
the primary legislation provided for that, and then there was an order which came before us which was challenged as well. And uh, the reason we were able to set aside that order was a very simple one, that it, it discriminated against non-British nationals. In other words, if you were a UK, UK national, then you were not open to this kind of order, but if you came from somewhere else, you were. And we took the view that that was, that was unacceptable discrimination, and we set aside the order. And that shook the government very much, and of course they began to become quite hostile to our court, because they felt we'd gone beyond what was our reasonable bounds. But we felt not at all. Our duty was to police, police the boundary between what was acceptable for the government to do and what was not. And uh, there have been a whole succession of cases that have gone forward, where uh, some of which uh, Shani might disagree with what our judgment was, but our function uh, was always to try to find the, 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 the dividing line between what the government was, was pushing forward for and what was uh, acceptable, um, whether it be in human rights terms or proportionality or whatever else it was. So that was my job for many, many years. And, um, I then uh, came back to the House of Lords. I'd been disqualified for four years sitting in the Lords because I was sitting in the Supreme Court, and you were not allowed to do both things. But when I, I left the Supreme Court, I went back into the House of Lords, which I got accustomed to, and then became used to sitting uh, doing, dealing with legislation. Now, legislation is a very interesting thing to be involved in because you're trying to design uh, a measure. Let's take the Public Order Act as, it, as, as an example, a, a, a bill which is going to have immense consequences uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. And my function, along with fellow law lords who precede, preceded me and, and uh, I've tried to follow their example, is to look at the language and to try to see that it makes sense. Uh, the definitions are needed sometimes. Sometimes the language, the thing is expressed as too vague. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you find things included in the, in the bill which really are completely unacceptable. For example, uh, yesterday we were being asked by the government to approve uh, one, uh, uh, one of the penalties for the breach of the, uh, of the um, the order, which seems to be the crime prevention order, which was to uh, do something which was contrary to an injunction which was presented, pres pronounced against somebody else. This is an injunction of which we had no notice, and yet it, there it was in the bill, sitting side by side with the criminal law itself, which of course we all have notice of. And that struck me as an extraordinary bit of legislation to come from the Home Office, which was quite contrary to ordinary principles. So it's an example of how uh, we can police that kind of thing in the House of Lords, uh, uh, in the legislative process, and it would certainly be policed in the Supreme Court if it had reached it. So I, I've been sitting in the margin, really, in the, in the, in the, sometimes disagreeing with Shani, and then supporting her absolutely in her amendment, which was extraordinary. The government opposed uh, by journalists. Why they did that, I simply don't know, but they did, and um, she was absolutely right to bring that forward. No, but the language point is where we have disagreed. But coming to the, the bill itself, I spoke against it at second reading because I thought, uh, not only somebody would say it's unnecessary, I thought it was unwise to simple out two very specific methods of protest, one of which is locking on, which has gone out of fashion, I think, now anyway, and the other is tunneling, which is a very, uh, a very specific thing, which is the anti-HS2 uh, campaign. And I thought to pick out two particular things when you've got all the rest of the public order legislation available was misguided because you pick out one and then somebody finds another and you haven't provided for that one. And I really do think the, the whole bill was misguided. And of course, it's been built up on that various other things which uh, the, the, we find objectionable. And I'm, I'm joined with them in the serious disruption and prevention order system, um, which uh, has been pushed far too far. Um, and it's, a, it's an example of legislation that I think is much more out of control, really. But um, the reason why she and I disagree is that I picked on two particular bits uh, of legislation which it's, I thought needed, needed clarification. The first is that uh, the, the, the offence dealing with both tunneling and locking on is, is being, uh, doing an, an act or being associated with an act which causes serious disruption. And uh, to um, 
uh, to, to, to a degree which obviously is unacceptable and needs to be prevented. Now, the, 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 the word serious disruption were not defined, and I produced an amendment which uh, was based on my reading of, of uh, the way the case law has been developed since Ziegler, uh, which um, uh, it tries to define the point at which you move from something which is uh, tolerable to something that is not, which is, becomes significant. And I try to identify the boundary between what is, is, is not, not uh, uh, which is not, is, is tolerable. And my language was that in order to justify intervention, it would have to be more than minor. The, the, the obstruction needs to be more than minor. Now, uh, I'm, that's what my reading is of the point at which you reach something that is significant and then has to be interfered with. The other point is reasonable excuse. And uh, um, the committee that I set up, sit up, which is the Constitutional Committee, took the view that to, to um, have a reasonable excuse um, defense that there at all was unacceptable. I didn't agree with that. I thought what you had to do was at least uh, narrow down what could be a reasonable excuse for somebody who was locking on. And the, 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 the point that I was making was that you can't say that, uh, uh, for example, the stop oil excuse would be I've got a reasonable excuse because I'm stopping oil. And that just meant that the legislation itself would be going around in a circle. And in order to break the circle, I had a formula of words which confined the reasonable excuse to something outside something which was a, a protest on a matter of public importance. Now, if we're dealing with very specific offences, locking on with all the consequences of people who are going to be there for a long time causing maybe major disruption and tunneling, which is designed actually to stop a project, a project going ahead. These are very extreme examples of protest, which I thought were quite different from the, the assembly protest or the marching protest, which um, many people indulge in, and I think um, uh, uh, work very well. And so I'm, I'm torn really before, from Jenny, because I'm looking at two particular um, uh, this legislation, which I think are otherwise, but are dealing with extreme examples. And in a way, the protesters who engage in these extreme examples have brought this on themselves, because I think the public are saying, locking on is really going too far. Uh, I live in, uh, on the central line, uh, and sorry I, sorry, I use the DLR quite a lot, and people were getting onto the DLR, locking themselves on, and preventing people at seven in the morning going to work. And I thought that really was unacceptable, and something had to be done uh, to stop that kind of thing. So I took a view that there are some bits of activity which do need to be intervened, and it sounds some way of one regards them as perfectly acceptable because of the public right of protest is essentially part of our democracy. Thank you, Lord. Stephanie. Thank you. Well, it seems that you have to start off by describing how you came to be where you are. And so maybe uh, that's fortunate because the reason why I'm a lawyer and why I became a barrister is because when I was at university, at Bristol University, which now would be something like 1985, uh, I got involved in a protest. And uh, we were protesting against um, a professor of modern history at Bristol University who had aligned himself and had a column in the Sun newspaper and had put himself at the forefront of what was then um, a movement that was all about dismantling multiculturalism, uh, the consensus about uh, women's rights, feminism. Uh, it has some very strong reson uh, resonance of what we have now with this notion of anti-woke situation, but we thought it was inappropriate for a professor of modern history to ally, to give, lend his status as a thinker and the university's credibility to what was a, uh, what we considered to be a uh, column in the Sun newspaper that was spouting a lot of derogatory, racist and sexist ideas. And so we thought it was a good idea to protest against him. And we held three protests outside of uh, his lecture and the university took uh, an injunction against us and uh, we were prohibited from protesting, we were prohibited from coming within, um, uh, there was a kind of an exclusion zone. So we weren't allowed to go to our lectures and, and then I also faced being uh, disciplined and potentially being uh, kicked out of the university. So that was my first experience of the law. 
So my first experience of a barrister didn't come from a family where there was a history of barristers, and I was fortunate to be represented by a barrister called Vera Baird, who some of you may know, who, who, was, um, who, who was a Labour MP, and I think now has a role as the czar for victims. No longer. No longer. But she, she became a, she, she shifted over to, from law to, well, she was a deeply impressive advocate, and I was amazed at, you know, here is a job that you could do where uh, you could advance idea, you know, you could represent cause, but you were, you were doing it in a particular way. And so that made me think, that's the job for me. So my route to the law is through exercising my right to protest and having an action taken against me that resulted in a civil injunction and the potential uh, for being uh, going to, not going to university. Fortunately, I, I did, that didn't happen to me. Uh, I was acquitted. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, we had a, the, the, the whole uh, disciplinary proceedings went on for about six weeks and half when it had a panel of um, academics and student representatives and halfway through they decided to switch two of the people because they couldn't carry on so they decided to remove two people who hadn't heard all the evidence for the first three weeks but they were going to make the decision at the end and our barrister Vera made a big deal about that I had no clue why that was significant now I know that it obviously it's fundamentally unfair to have people making a judgment where they hadn't heard half the evidence so in the end the whole thing was overturned but it, uh, it gave me this insight into how the law uh, can be used for good and bad, and, um, and prompted me to think about a career at the bar. And so it is a concern to me, not just because of that personal experience, but where you have a piece of legislation that could result in a situation where if you have breached an injunction and you've been found to be in contempt, not only do you face problems in terms of contempt, and contempt can mean that you have exposed to unlimited fines, it can mean you can go to prison for up to two years, which is generally a penalty that is much greater than most of the penalties for relatively minor public order offences. So it's already a draconian measure, and because it's civil proceedings, you may well be exposed to costs, implications, and I'm sure Bristol University, what they did, they instructed a QC it's called Wigmore, and uh, I'm sure his fees were, you know, if I'd have had to pay for them, they would be pretty considerable. So that's contempt, but on top of that now, this legislation, if it becomes law, means that if you're found to be in contempt of court, you can be subject to uh, a serious disruption order. And as Shami has said, these orders are draconian. They are measures that Parliament introduced to, to address what was said to be a threat from terrorism. I was a barrister involved in some of those cases mm -hmm. arguing against control orders because the combination of powers that are permissible, uh, in the, which, which include electronic monitoring, include restrictions on your rights uh, to, to um, move, your free movement rights, and in combination they can have very severe impacts on your fundamental rights. And that is on the basis that you have previously breached an injunction. And so that fills me with a great deal of concern about the very notion of, of, of a measure that could do that. And obviously, in, con in the context where, as Lord Hope has said, there's very real questions about what does serious disruption mean? I have to say I'd be very concerned if it was something more than minor, because it's absolutely plain that, in my view, that the Strasbourg Court would not treat something more than minor as serious disruption. Serious disruption has to have a very significant impact on everyday life. And it has to go beyond what's in, in, uh, intrinsic to protest. Of course, protest causes disruption. That's by its very nature. Uh, that's its purpose in some respects, not to cause the disruption, but to bring to your attention through uh, various mechanisms. And it, it, it can be through <coughs> limited activities like for example locking on or it can be through mass demonstrations they cause disruption and that's what draws people's attention to the issue that you're seeking to um, to, 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 to protest about and um, any protest that has significant numbers of people involved is going to cause serious disruption 
that focuses on airlines or fossil fuel, um, if it's, uh, it, it's going to be focused in a way that inevitably does cause uh, disruption. And so being able to draw the line in advance between what's acceptable disruption in a protest context and what's serious disruption and unacceptable, in my view, is impossible to do. It has to be done you know, on, the, on, on the individual facts of the case, rather than seeking in advance to circumscribe and define um, preemptively what's serious disruption and what's not. And um, similarly, there are other elements of the, of the legislation which seek to curtail protest through general words like obstruction and interference, uh, but, but uh, which obviously in themselves are broad terms. But again, the law recognizes that some forms of obstruction on the public highway, some forms of interference, even though they occur, are nevertheless uh, uh, part and parcel, again, of lawful protest. And that's why the reasonable excuse defence is so important, because that's been the traditional way in which the uh, balance has been uh, addressed between the disruption and the obstruction and the interference that's a, a part of the protest uh, is balanced out. And where up until recently, it was the view, it was the law, there was, it was a case of Ziegler saying that at that point, your convention rights and the notion of proportionality would come into play so that yes, it was accepted that there could be in the exercise of your fundamental right to free speech or assembly, uh, a degree of obstruction or interference uh, that wouldn't necessarily wouldn't mean that you were committing a criminal offence. And it's that, there's been a recent sort of Supreme Court decision that has, has, uh, has, has uh, drawn very different lines now, but in my view, wrongly, because it has shifted the balance very much against the ability for people to exercise their fundamental rights and um, in favour of curtailing free speech and assembly. And what I would say is that one of the things about injunctions, and that was the case that I was involved in today in the Court of Appeal, in a very minor part, I was intervening on behalf of Friends of the Earth, you know, what seems like a very esoteric situation, which is called persons on known injunctions. Mm -hmm. So instead of having an injunction against a named person, you have done this, you protested against Professor Vincent, and therefore you should be the subject of the injunction, you can have a persons on known injunction defined by their conduct. So not a case where you've got a named person who uh, can defend themselves and can, um, can go to court and argue their case. And the use of persons on known injunctions has since 2017 exploded as a mechanism for uh, dealing with protest. And what you have to realize about that is that it allows for orders to be made against persons who are not before the court when the order is made and who will only become a party to a claim at the point at which they breach the injunction. So you only become before the court, subject to the jurisdiction of the court, at the point at which you've breached it and you're in contempt, which has enormous consequences, particularly for your for fair trial rights and natural justice, because you, you're, you are liable to penalty in circumstances where you have had no opportunity to put your case, and you won't have the opportunity on contempt, because contempt is not about well, I was exercising my rights and it wasn't excessive, my participation in this was ex it, it, it's, it's effectively subject to knowledge, and all that's limited, uh, strict liability. If you breach the order, until that order is set aside, um, you have, um, you're in contempt. So it allows for a draconian measure of a situation where you, not only if persons on known injunctions are also an injunction for, from which a serious disruption order would have been made. An injunction could have been made when you were not party to the proceedings. You have breached it because it's only through breach that you become a party to the proceedings. 
and at the same time, you would therefore also be liable uh, to a serious disruption prevention order, which has all the dramatic consequences. And we don't need to go to the European Convention on Human Rights to know that that is wrong. That is so fundamentally contrary to any notion of procedural fairness and natural justice in the common law. And if, it's, if that's a consequence, there's sufficient in the common law that also protects our fundamental rights to, to, a, to free speech and assembly. Of course, we have got the Human Rights Act, uh, but we shouldn't need it to say that this sort of uh, measure is contrary to our basic bottom line understanding of, of, of where the power of the state ends and where the rights of the individual rises. Of course, Parliament can override those and, and, and it will do that, but let's not have this as a debate about, well, it's the Human Rights Act that's going to stop us doing this. Before we get to that, we need it because mm -hmm. that's our entrenched rights, um, at least subject to permanent compatibility orders. But we have these rights and we are losing them and as has been said, without um, very much understanding and recognition um, in, um, in the uh, wider population. And I think the last thing that I would want to say is that when we focus on how to address the problem that is created by people protesting, what we shouldn't do is to forget the issues that people are protesting about because they are not marginal issues. Um, Black Lives Matter was about structural discrimination, race discrimination uh, that, uh, that is of critical importance in our society, measures to address long-standing historical injustice and discrimination, and of course the environmental crisis. And when we look back a hundred years and we think about the suffragettes, what do we, do we celebrate? Do we celebrate the laws that imprisoned the suffragettes and uh, prevented them from protesting, including through disruptive means? Or do we say that right was on their side and history was on their side because it was wrong to prevent women from voting and participating on an equal basis uh, with, with men? And I'm pretty confident, I would hope, that in a hundred years' time, what people will say when they look at this response to these enormously pressing issues that affect disproportionately some people when it comes to racism, but also are all affected by the planet's uh, catastrophe that we face, who's on the right side? Is it those people who are raising that issue and asking for something to be done about it? Or is it those who would introduce laws that would prevent their message being, being uh, articulated. And I think um, I'll go back to myself <laughs> when I was 20 in Bristol and I'm saying I'm on the side of the protesters. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, what you described there in relation to the injunctions just strikes me as shocking. It's just difficult to imagine that any lawyer, any law student could ever attempt to defend that. But I just want to try, before I open it up to the, to the room, to try and bring out a couple of tensions between some of the comments that, that, that you and Shami were making and Lord Hope were making on the other side. And this is around to what extent can we identify limits to, to the freedom to protest? Are, are, where, where are there such limits? Are there, are there, are there, are there, are there no limits? And so, so Lord Hope, in relation to the, the, the issue of serious disruption and block on generating serious disruption, he, he referred to uh, uh, the difficulties that the people face getting into London. You know, People jumping on trains, people jumping on DLR. So that's one example of what some people might describe as serious disruption, which I'm pretty confident you would say that just simply is not enough to justify such an intrusion. But I can think of other examples that have been in the press recently. One example from Germany recently was um, protesters, climate protesters, glued their, their hands to the, to the road. Uh, a, um, a, a bicyclist, was, a cyclist was knocked off his bike, seriously injured, and the, and the, the ambulance couldn't get through and he died. Um, and so there's another more problematic example. But of course, the people who glued their hands to the, to the street had absolutely no conception that anything so catastrophic would, would happen. But so, so a question to the two of you really is, is, that, is there a space ever for the law to intervene to prevent protests in relation to serious disruption? And, and, and then if there is, then, then where are you going to define that limit? So, so of course, um, it is well recognized 
in both common sense and um, and the convention jurisprudence that um, that the fundamental right to protest is not an absolute right. It's, it is a qualified right. Um, so, so, so of course, um, but it, it, there is an element of context sensitivity about this. And um, my favourite, my favourite ever uh, legal philosopher, I think, was the late great Ronald Dworkin. And when I was an undergraduate and discovering his work, I loved his concept of good law as like a donut. Because it's not a jam donut, this is a ring donut, where the, where the dough part represents rules and the gap in the middle is discretion. And I think a, a really important part of the rule of law in, in any, whether, it, whether it's, you know, in the US or the UK or in, in the convention, in the Council of Europe, pick your favourite legal system. If you think it's roughly working, there is probably, particularly in the criminal law context, it's going to be the right amount of rules and discretion. Now, in relation to gluing yourself to the road, well, that, to my mind, is obviously an obstruction of the highway. That doesn't mean ethically it's always wrong, but it is probably always already a criminal offence. And then the police who are trying to keep the peace, they're not actually, the, 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 you know, the principal job of a civilian police force is not to run around arresting people for prosecution, it is to keep the peace. They are part of the community, they're keeping the peace. Sometimes the best thing to do when someone's obstructing the highway is to, is to move them on without even arresting them. Sometimes it's to arrest them to, uh, so the traffic can now proceed and then let them go. Um, it shouldn't very often be, uh, I think, about overzealous arrests and detentions and prosecutions, particularly at a time when the criminal courts are, uh, are on their knees. So I would say to you, in response to the very elegant straw man that you began to erect for me, <laughs> that there are already all sorts of criminal offences that these people have committed. That doesn't mean they should always be arrested or always prosecuted or always convicted or always sentenced to imprisonment because we need to have the rule and the discretion. As to whether you can... Um, so in legal terms, of course there are legal limits to your right to dissent, and then there is also, I also believe in ethics, and there are times when even I might consider breaking the law in the face of tyranny. Now, I don't think I've ever done it yet, but I'm not gonna say that as an ethical human being in certain circumstances, I wouldn't do that, particularly if the law was very unjust and there was, and there was tyranny. And that was clearly what the suffragettes thought. And that is what some, but that is a matter for each individual and their conscience that there was plenty of law already, people who glued themselves to the road have already been sentenced to imprisonment. So don't tell me that we needed another performative piece of cultural war legislation so that various Home Secretaries and Prime Ministers can, can say that they're fighting a war against the woke. Thank you, I, I think I think that... Oh, sorry, yes, it's better. Yes, yes, I think a lot depends on the way in which the protesters are protesting, what the method of protest is. Um, and uh, there's a very interesting case from the European uh, Court, uh, the Grand Chamber was being with a case, I think, called Kuzovikius or something, mm -hmm. in against Lithuania in 2015. And they used a phrase which um, caught my attention when they said that it's one thing if the disruption and inconvenience is a side issue, and it's different if the disruption is targeted because they are actually, their method of process, the protest rather, is to exactly do what um, is, is happening. In other words, taking tunneling, they are actually, their method of process is to completely disrupt the construction of the rolling line. Now, many people have different views about HS2, many object to it, but the fact is it does have parliamentary authority and it's an extremely expensive pro project. And therefore, um, for people to um, uh, tunnel, to stop the project being, uh, being advanced, is going to cause disruption and a good deal of money, and uh, to disrupt the, the, the project itself. And they're not going to go away, which is why I thought that as soon as it reaches the point at which it is more than minor, it's become significant to drop the word in your amendment. Uh, That's the point at which the sh thing should be stopped. Uh, there's no point in just letting it go on and on and on. As the project is 
is, uh, is, is in suspense and money is being wasted. Now, um, I, that's a very specific example of a disruption which uh, I think uh, justifies a more extreme intervention. And I think locking on uh, may fall into the same, uh, same uh, category because the whole point of them doing it is to disrupt. It's the targeted thing. The disruption is not a side issue, to go back to the phrase that was used in that case. And um, that's the distinction which I would draw. Now, um, I, I know people disagree, but I think uh, I'm on the side of those who feel that there are some kinds of protest that do need to be uh, capable of being stopped before they get uh, to a point where really there is a significant uh, disruption. And I use the word significant as a point at which it becomes unacceptable. But the word significant was what was in my amendment, and more than minor hindrance were in your amendment. Yes, because I say you pounds more significant than more than minor. <laughs> this is I mean, a very interesting form of words. I, I found, I was just thinking to myself, we can't, um, we, we can't legislate in numbers. We've got to use language. Yeah. We don't use algorithms. It's got to be now. That will come, I fear. And, and <laughs> the problem is, you then use adjectives, <laughs> and adjectives are loaded with uh, different Plus. disagreement. And one person's view of what is significant will differ. Yeah. A police officer's view of what but is remember, significant. But remember, we only were in this place in the first, we only were into that debate in the first place mm. because of a bad piece of law that came before us. And so where we agreed, Lord Hope, was that there needed to be some, this, this concept of serious disruption is mentioned so many times yes. in the public order bill. Mm. Um, and, and various politicians uh, are expounding on the airways about every, every trivial interference with life is now you know, a, a huge thing, that the police were actually asking for some definition yes. of serious disruption. And serious disruption in the public order bill is there in some of the new offences, it's also there in the serious disruption orders, and, uh, and so on. So um, we agreed there needed to be a definition. Lord Hope said, well, more than minor is significant. And I said, no, significant harm to people um, or property, or the uh, or the life of the community is the kind of standard that I want. But then, we're, then we're having the semantic to some yes. extent. You know, See, my my point is, as soon as it becomes significant, then it should be stopped. Yeah, but you think it's a, as soon as it stops. Yeah, but no, no, but significant. Uh, we just dis I say si I say significant harm. You say more than minor hindrance. And I think the difference between no, that, that literally this was a very interesting. It was actually quite an interesting debate in, in in the house last week. I think it was. And it seems to me that if you say that um, that it's a binary, and there is minor, and there is major, then you can say, well, more than minor equals major. Now, that's Cole Porter every time you say goodbye. But actually, I think to a police officer or the man on the street, more than minor would, 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 would seem down there, and significant would be up there, and there's actually a spectrum in between them. But that's how we understand language. Well, you know. I know, and this is the problem with legislation, isn't yeah. it? Those are the tools we've been given. One has to make the best of it. And, um, but the offences were too were too vague and too dangerous. I mean, locking on, by the way, isn't just chaining yourself to the railings or gluing yourself to. It could be the minister told us that locking on could be linking arms mm -hmm. with your friends because the words used are attaching yourself. Attaching yourself to persons or property or places is now this new offence of locking on. And worse still, there's a thought crime that goes next, that is clause two, which is going equipped to lock on. Okay. So what's that, your bicycle chains and your... Sounds like if you take your arms, you might be in trouble. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we give you a chance to come back and then open up. I, I think it, if we can have a, a debate about the words, but isn't, it doesn't, it, let's, let's put it into a, into a real life situation. So I don't know if anyone of you have seen the film Selma, which is uh, Martin Luther King uh, organising the demonstration on the bridge, which was to prevent, you know, it was blocking a bridge into the town of Selma. Of course it was going to cause serious disruption, just as it might be if you lock, if you glue your hands to the M25. Um, so do we think that was objectionable? Is, is it would have caused more than minor disruption if you block a major road into a city but it now has iconic status as a symbolic representation of the civil rights movement in the United States. A whole movie is made about it because it is significant and people taking that step to join a protest like that, to, to make their voice heard, was a huge step at the time. 
it would have had consequences. It was obviously a, a responded to with ex acute violence. Uh, but those are the kinds of situations where you also have to think. You could, it, it, it's, it's always the case, bad circumstances make bad laws. So if you, if you present the tunneler, I'm going to struggle to find a justification for tunneling. And I, I can see that. But once you have these words used, like serious disruption, they don't stop there. There is extraordinary mission creep yeah. in everything that, this, uh, that, that is happening yeah. um, and it, at enormous pace. Uh, so that I think it is always important to not just to, to, to look at the wider context, look at how protest really works in practice. If you have a million people who object to the Iraq war, that is going to bring this this country to a standstill, or London to a standstill. It did. Well, it's funny that it's funny that you you say that because the um, the Iraq War example was actually um, spoken about in the in, in the House of Lords last week by an interesting person, Lord Deben, formerly known as John Selwyn Gummer, who was a Conservative MP and is now a Conservative peer, and he's broadly he's a Conservative. He's broadly supportive of the government's position, but. During the course of the debate, not about serious disruption, I think about reasonable excuse, where Lord Hope and I were again on opposite sides. Um, um, and so, so roughly the difference between us is that um, Lord Hope took the view that, um, and I understand the logic of it, I just, uh, I just disagree with the, with the outcomes. Um, Lord Hope takes the view that if these offences are, are anti-protest offences, then surely protest can never be part of your reasonable defence. Am I roughly right about that? Well, this is where we have an interesting difference of view, I think, on what the Supreme Court is saying. Because the, the, um, the Ziegler case um, has been interpreted as, as requiring a proportionality assessment yes. in each case. Yeah. And, um, and therefore, and the, 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 the example of what happened was the Colston statue, remember this when it was pulled down, and it went to a jury, and the jury acquitted the defendants. And it went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal has reacted against that. And, uh, and in a series of decisions, and that was the second one, I think, had been trying to come back from Ziegler and narrow down the opportunities for well, proportionality sorry. assessment. That's what they've been doing. And, um, and um, this phrase was used by um, Lord Chief Justice saying there may be some cases in which a proportionality assessment would be appropriate, that they will not be many. No, but, but no, no, here's, here's, my, here's my point about reasonable excuse and about proportionality. Go back to my donut. We need some rules, but we also need discretions in the system. And actually, for a jury to make what some people call a perverse acquittal is actually quite a good piece of discretion in the system when there's a, when there's a bad law or a bad situation or a million people all think that this is a very serious matter. And I'm not too worried about that sometimes happening because that safety valve in the system is a good thing. But say we just say say I'm wrong and say that Ziegler's wrong and it should all be tightened up. And goodness me, this, this bill is about shutting down protest. It is now an offence to be a protester. So clearly, a reasonable excuse cannot lie in when I was protesting. Say that is the logic and that stands up. What about this? What about a million people in Parliament Square? And, this, and Lord Deben mentioned this last week. A million people in Parliament Square and the police are not going to run around arresting people because they don't have the resources and they don't want to be on the wrong side of a million people in Parliament well, Square. So just to finish the point, so he was making a political point, Lord Deagle was making a political point, don't put the police in this difficult position, and it gave me this thought. What if instead of not arresting anyone in these circumstances, the police just arrest the people in wheelchairs, or just arrest the women because they're easier to arrest, or just arrest the black people, and they then get prosecuted, nobody else. Now, if that protester is going to, uh, to avoid a terrible discriminatory injustice, that protester has to be able to say, in, as a reasonable excuse, that I was only protesting like everybody else, but it's only us black people that got arrested and prosecuted. And if Forgive me, Lord Hope, if, if your amendment had succeeded and protest could never be part of the reasonable excuse, that discrimination in the enforcement of the anti-protest law wouldn't have, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have been there. Well, I think I, I 
think that assemblies um, you have different sizes and, and a, a huge assembly it is assembling for the purpose of marching along with the banners and so on, displaying the banners, making the noise and whatever else comes with it. And the fact that they're blocking the road, the European Court Grand Chamber might say it was a side issue, because that's not what they're, they're not setting out to block the road as such, they just want to gather together. But, well, that's, 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 that's what's what the was, difference then with Extinction Rebellion? Yes. Because the Extinction Rebellion protests were mass protests, and they did have as a purpose, or certainly as a consequence, uh, disruption to the life of the city, and it went on for weeks. But were they knocking on? Uh, they didn't. They, <coughs> there was, see, no, there wasn't an element of blocking on. But trouble, I, but I there, you need to be very careful um, as to what the method is and what the object was of, um, of the particular form of protest. I think that's the distinction which the Grand Chamber were drawing, and which um, was filtered through. Um, could, could I say, this is a brilliant conversation, but I want, we haven't got so much time left, so I wanted to give uh, everyone oh, yeah. in the room yes, a, a chance to ask some, use your free some questions. Yeah, use your free speech. Uh, now, if you, you don't have any, if you don't have any questions, we can let this keep rolling because it's fantastic. So, uh, so I'll take Peter's first, and I'll come to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You can introduce yourself when you speak. Is it, am I on? You are um, Peter Ramsey uh, from the Law Department at LSE. Um, just to say right off the bat, just a factual point, the XR um, protests are not mass protests. I mean, the, the comparison with the, the Iraq demonstration is instructive. The Iraq demonstration, that was a mass protest, and none of this law is relevant. I, I, I take your point about um, the discriminatory use of protest law, and I don't want to get into the detail of your argument here because I don't know it. But it's very important that these are not mass protests, and, and the uh, Just Stop Oil protests are not mass protests. Uh, I think politically, uh, that's essential to understand for a point I want to come on to. Um, I agree that, the, that this legislation is political grandstanding. It seems to, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in your legal view, but it seems to me that the tunnelling offence is essentially unnecessary. If the political will existed to stop protesters against uh, HS2, it's a public nuisance, as, as plain as you face. It's, it's, you know, it's open and shut presence, public nuisance. Yeah. Now, we, I can see that there'd be anxiety about using public nuisance law because it's so vague and broad and all the rest of it, but it's there. And so it, this is a classic case, and, and Labour did it, Jack Straw did it against the animal rights protesters. He passed new laws when there were perfectly yeah. adequate laws that existed. So the law was being, legislation was being used to avoid, because they lacked the will to actually enforce existing laws. And I suspect that something similar is going on here. So I'm very sympathetic to that. I'm even more sympathetic to the view that the serious disruption French orders are a, a really serious threat um, to political freedom in, in Britain because they, the most alarming things are the preventive detention aspect of them and the electronic monitoring aspect of them. Oh, is it gone? I'm looking at. I'm well, sorry. Moment, I was looking at the last version that Parliament put up of the bill. So is that gone? Well, we had some votes last night. No, oh, they're, they're the last. One. Sorry, I said. Keep up, Peter. Come on. Just <laughs> <laughs> refresh. Just press refresh. Um, no. Idea. Anyway, they haven't changed it yet. Um, so I agree with all of that. What I'm very worried about is the potential slippage in Stephanie Harrison's argument. When you say I take the side of the protesters, um, now that's your right as a, as a citizen, but I'm worried about whether the lo you slip into the law should take the side of the protesters, which it definitely shouldn't. The law should not interfere with their right to protest, that's, but that's not taking the side of the protesters. It's taking the side of protest, that's maybe, semantic. or of political freedom. That's semantic. It's not, for this reason. So the Attorney General's reference case uh, um, narrowing the Ziegler case seems to me to be, as, as a, someone who's a strong partisan of civil liberty, to be a reasonable decision uh, and to be one that does not restrict uh, freedom of expression in a, or protest in, in, in a way that we should worry about, because, precisely because it narrows the use of uh, the proportionality assessment of Article 10, the, the deployment of Article, um, uh, the, the, the ECHR arguments, uh, to exclude protesters who use who, who to do serious criminal damage or violence which are not necessary to protest they're not necessary to put your point of view to exercise your freedom of speech to assemble with other people they're not necessary for any of those things and if 
if the, the, the narrowing of Ziegler was to remove those arguments in relation to public order offences, then you'd be right. That would be very worrying. Um, but it's not. And so the reason that that seems to me in, in very important is that um, if, you, if, the, if, if your interpretation is the law should take the side of protesters who do criminal damage or serious violence, then, um, uh, then you are undermining, you're politicizing the law. If, you, if, you, if the objection is that the cost and for uh, protesters uh, who did the criminal damage was stripped of a human rights defense, that's to take the side of the protesters, not to take the side of freedom of expression. Yeah, yeah. And just I to just finish, my last, yeah. last point. What worries me about this is that it actually, un it, amongst the mass of ordinary people who are not here, um, we notice, um, it undermines the argument against very serious threats to freedom of expression. The, the prevention order, which I agree with you, is a very serious threat. By, by making political arguments against reasonable decisions that have been made to... to, to can I, can I just respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my observation about the side of the protesters was the historical, let's look back. And in that respect, and why it is important, is to focus on what, it, what is the message that, they, that, that people are, are, are taking these steps about. And so it was in that context that I made that observation. Clearly, there, there are limits and there are restrictions, uh, but it seems to me that the restrictions that are being proposed are uh, unnecessary for the reasons that we, you've indicated. There already is in place legislation that could that deal with all of these issues, and then what? And the men, and on top of that, there are additional steps that have been taken that are clearly excessive and draconian, um, and so. That's my concern about it. But uh, in terms of the side of the protesters, I'm on the side of the, of the message that, the, that those people are talking about. And ultimately, in 100 years' time, we will be judged by how did we respond to the challenge of historical structural racism? How did we respond to the uh, climate catastrophe? That's what's really going to be important, isn't it? Uh, so it's in that respect that I, I made that observation. So, um, so, so, so what I would say to you, sir, is that um, um, when I said uh, when I said earlier that I could imagine a situation, I would not rule out one day having to break the law. That has not been my dilemma yet. But as a, but if we separate the ethical the, the ethical framework from the legal framework for a moment, I can imagine that in certain circumstances, living under tyranny, I might break the law. I was a, I was a government lawyer. I was um, subject to the Official Secrets Act, and I did have access to national security information, but I wasn't a whistleblower. That dilemma didn't, occur, didn't happen. But I would say to anybody who ever considers um, being um, even a whistleblower or, or doing something else that's a, that's a breach of the law, that is the moment when your ethical duty becomes greater, not lesser, because once you've crossed that line, you now have to make ethical decisions about to what extent you are prepared to break the law. And I personally think that the human rights framework then becomes an ethical guide, and you have now, because you are now playing God, or, or, or playing government, or playing leg, you know, legislator without the legitimacy to do that, because you decided. I mean, this is why, for example, I didn't, uh, when some whistleblowers um, name people on a blanket basis and put them at risk. I'm not naming names, but there are some legendary whistleblowers that do that. I think that can be very dangerous because they put lives at risk. Other whistleblowers, um, when they when they blow the whistle, are much more meticulous about redacting things so that people's lives aren't at risk. But so, so I think that you can be an ethical protester even if you are going to be breaking some laws like some criminal damage. Um, or some obstructing the highway, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. That, that would sort of be on the, on, the Ziegler, on the Ziegler and Northern Ireland reference point. I agree with you that there are distinctions to be made um, with different criminal offences and different legislative schemes. And I think in, some, in, in, in dealing with some offences more than others, when, when Parliament hasn't, in the creation of an offence itself, been precise enough or being proportionate enough, then you know, you know, the donut needs more of a, you know, if you've got if you've got bad dough, you need you need you need more discretion. And I think that the courts, including the Strasbourg Court, will do that. 
in, fu in future judgments, post Siegler and post Northern Ireland reference, they will look at the actual legislative scheme to see whether the legislature gave sufficient consideration to things like proportionality when they legislated. And if they did, then there'll be a lighter touch to the judicial scrutiny that comes along afterwards. Thank you, Sharon. Lord, uh, briefly, then we need, to, we need to bring a couple of people. We're already yes. significantly over time, so we can well, take two more questions. I'll be quite brief. Thank you. This is political grandstanding, and I think the unfortunate thing is that the <coughs> particular forms of protest brought it on themselves because of the political pressure for the, the, the party to go out against it. And I think that's most unfortunate, and it's produced legislation, which, uh, as I said, its second reading was unnecessary and, um, and, and misguided. Uh, and a good example of how it's unnecessary is that there was a divisional court decision uh, dealing with a tunneler. I've got this name, but it was under the aggravated protest, aggravated trespass. And um, that was the first occasion when the court, the, the divisional court said a proportionality assessment was not necessary there because it was such an obvious, <coughs> the, whole, the whole aim of the thing was to cause the, 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 the hold to the project. And, and you can't have a reasonable excuse. And the reasoning in the, um, in the, in the more recent case, the Colston case, is quite interesting because the Court of, the court of Appeal was saying, well, there are some uh, actions for which there could be no reasonable excuse. If you stab somebody, um, you can't have a reasonable excuse. I mean, meaning a self self defense and so on. And then they move down the grade, and then they take the grade even really down too far. And I think you would say too far. But that's the point at which they say that uh, these assessments are, uh, uh, will, will, will not be required in all but a few cases. And the question is whether they reduce the level to the level. So we've got time for two questions. Um, so gentlemen here and then Ian Carr. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. But we have drinks outside, so if you can enjoy a few drinks, then you can, you can quiz the panelists then. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Andras Chantosh. I'm an exchange student here. Uh, department. Um, I'm uh, wondering, uh, th th this bill isn't exact, didn't spring up in isolation, it's, it's uh, we have had the, the, the police courts, yeah. Yeah. police yeah. crime, yeah. sentencing yeah. courts act yeah. last yeah. year, we have the immigration law report. National Security Borders Act. National Security yeah. Borders, now the, the recent one we have some provisions in the online safety bill that all, all point in Voter suppression legislation as well. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, I'm wondering, um, how do you anticipate both this piece of legislation and, and, and this broader uh, pattern of, of uh, a reduction in civil liberties faring in the Supreme Court? Um, in their, w w do you anticipate any declarations of accountability in any of this? And then uh, on the political plane, perhaps to Bernard's talk about the, um, the conservatives are very loudly demanding all of this plus uh, um, Raising the prospect of these leaving the ACHR, but um, your party, I mean, the, the Brown Commission's constitutional reform proposals don't even include the words Human Rights Act. So, do, do you think that, that, that the, um, uh, the, the opposition is doing a good enough job of um, protecting the existing uh, rights entrenchments that we have? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> very difficult. Uh, this is where I start to square yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. um, no, I. I um, I think you're right to look at the broader political context of this, and you're right that this bill is not alone, and it sits within this broader um, authoritarian stroke culture. Of, you know, we've had the authoritarian creep for years with both parties, but now we've got this culture war thing as well. And so you've got a Home Secretary, for example, who is a lawyer herself, um, being scathing about lawyers. And that's sort of cool because that's how you get a standing ovation at your Conservative Party conference. And then, you know, and, you know, she, anyway, you, you you get what I'm saying. And I think where they're probably, and, and I think I think when inequality, when poverty and inequality is at the levels that it currently is um, in in this country, um, it is all the, the, the populist right will reach for divide and rule. And so you turn people against each other, not on the god. You know, the gods on Olympus can just ke keep making their mega, mega bucks, but you turn the people against each other. And and, and, and the, the reason for their poverty and for inequality is because of refugees, because of work protesters, because of activist lawyers, and fill in and, and fill in the 
and, and, and I think that it's been of some success to the populist right, both in the United States with Mr. Trump and, um, and in other places too. And, uh, and that's the playbook. It's the populist uh, right-wing playbook and, uh, and race will always play a certain role in that. And that is why uh, we believe, because we read the newspapers, that uh, Mr. Sunak, despite being the first non-white prime minister of this country, has been advised that he should make the next election, if he is to stand a chance of winning it, a small votes election, um, and uh, with the threat of pulling out of the ECHR. Though, of course, refugees are ultimately protected by the Refugee Convention, but they don't, they don't worry about forensic details of, of, of that kind, um, because they want it to be Brexit too. And of course, it's nothing to do forensically, logically, legally with Brexit, but Brexit, for some people, is a feeling, not a policy. And it is, and it is an appetite that is not, that is never sated. And there are people on the populist right of the, not it's not the whole Conservative Party by any stretch. I don't want to defame, you know, tradi lots of traditional rule of law conservatives who really care about Churchill's legacy um, of the ECHR. To some extent, there is some mileage in that, by the way. There's some historical truth in that. Um, but for the others, once it was Dominic Cummings and this chap called Mr. Levito, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they think. You know, it's the threat of pulling out, pulling out of the ECHR will be like pulling out of the EU and will demonise these desperate people in little boats, which I find astonishing because, you know, this country's national myth, it's not just Shakespeare and Elgar, it's also about little boats, right? The Dunkirk spirit was about saving people in little boats, not drowning them, and um, there we have it. But that, that's where I think we're heading with this. Will Labour do the right thing? I believe so. I believe so. Not least because I think that the Human Rights Act is something that people across the Labour Party are very, are very, are very proud of. And I think because for all the Labour Party's anxieties, it is, it is still um, an internationalist party. Um, and I think, I think the ECHR is something that, you know, that doesn't mean we're always as vocal as I would like us to be, you know, this is, this is my area, the, the, these are my issues. But I think yesterday and last week on the Public Order Bill, we were, in, we were in a very good place. And by the way, not just the Labour Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, and, uh, and, a, number of, um, uh, and a number of cross benches. But that's the weirdness of the, of the British House of Lords. Thank you, Shami. So we've got hardly any time left so we could just get the two questions and then give it all the panelists an opportunity to to respond you can make it super brief with Callum, and then i'll bring you in super brief as well so otherwise there's going to be protest in this room in fact the fact that i'm stealing your time so um let me, let me come. okay my name is michael mongol and i'm visiting professor here and i'm ju a federal judge in israel so we face uh, a similar problem my question is uh, especially to you if i may um the chilling effect of those laws, even if the police will not arrest them, it's a problem because the police officer in the street, I don't think he can really or she can really tell if it's more than minor or less than extensive or whatever. But let's say they do or let's say they don't bother and they let most of the protest go through. But there is a problem of chilling effect that people the normal people, not the hardcore protests that will go on no matter what, and they will go on even if they are imprisoned or whatever. But most of the people are not. And if it's a million people, it's not a problem. If it's a million people protest, everybody will come. But smaller things, which are very important, such laws have chilling effect because people don't want to get into even into money problems of hiring a lawyer now to, to deal with the whole thing, even if it will end up with nothing. So I would like to hear your view about it. Let's just take the next final question and then we'll take comments from all the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Yusuf. I'm a first year PP student here. Um, my question, it might be, it's quite a simple question, I think, but at first glance to me, this bill seems uh, counterintuitive because surely, like, as we can see here, lots of people won't agree with this bill. Um, it seems like obvious that it's wrong, etc. And so wouldn't that incite like, even more protests um, against it? And then given that, I'm sure the government can foresee that, like, what will they respond with? 
they'll have to just arrest even more people and they would just erupt into like a much bigger problem. Um, so just underlying that, what, what, what is the government trying to achieve? Because they know it's going to be a very big problem to the people. So they're trying to like set a high bar and then like only get half of the reward or like they're trying to pass the entire thing. Um, you know, what's that underlying motive behind it? Thank you. So we start with Lord Hope, Stephanie, then well, can I say, first of all, going back to a previous point, if I may, um, I think you have to come, you're absolutely right to look at this legislation in its overall context and what the government is up to. And I say that against the background that what I lived through in the Supreme Court was the post-11 anti-terrorist mm -hmm. feeling. And that did risk getting out of hand. And um, I mentioned already the Belmarsh case, which uh, uh, really aggravated the government uh, to a large degree. <coughs> And there were rumours going around at that time that the government were actually trying to uh, to extinguish the opportunity of judicial review. And, it, and judicial review was being used uh, um, quite actively to try to restrain the government from time to time. And um, it reached a point where one or two of us in the Supreme Court were wondering whether we really had to accept the absolute sovereignty of Parliament. If Parliament was to go to abolish judicial review, would we accept that? And I was one of those who said, well, there are limits to sovereignty. Um, and that's the kind of position in which I was in in those days. So I think the context point is a very good one. Should in effect, you're absolutely right. I'm not so worried about it as you may be. I've never been in protest, so maybe I'm just not, not as sensitive as you are. But it's a very good point that there is a point at which you really have to get, you know, you get worried that you're cutting off the willingness to protest. But that would be quite wrong. I think um, uh, it really we must resist against that. And, um, and that's why I say it's the method of protest that I'm concerned about, the more extreme targeted kind, which one has been. Where I'm not dealing with the ordinary people protesting about uh, the supermarket next door or something like that. These are quite different things. So one has to choose one particular subject matter, but you're absolutely right about it. Thank you, Mr. Um, I, I agree with you that that is a is a key issue that that these measures are always justified by the fact that they are targeted at an unlawful protest, but in every respect they they have a mission creep and they have the chilling effect that you've described. And certainly, the interest one of the interesting things is about the symbiosis between. The, the, the criminal law and civil injunctions. So uh, in 2017, uh, a company called Ineos, which is the, you know, it's run by uh, Jim Radcliffe, who's the wealthiest man in Britain, decided that he was going to get a super injunction, and he was going to, um, uh, through his lawyers, identify conduct such as locking on, such as slow walking, was a form of protest that was linked to fracking, anti-fracking, and that's what it was all about. And he was going to go to the Chancery Division of the High Court to get an order that would say, this form of conduct is unlawful and you can't do it, and then if you do, you'll be subject to contempt and all of those things. And ultimately, the courts have really not, have not accepted that approach because it does have the, the exactly where it has chilling effect on lawful protests, because not all locking on is going to be cause disruption. Not all locking on is going to cause an obstruction. There's plenty of cases in the magistrate's courts where locking on was used in the context of anti-fracking, and the magistrate concluded that it wasn't, didn't meet the threshold for disruption, and it, in any event, it was that they, they concluded it was really disproportionate to, to have prosecuted this person for that. So, so it's very easy to kind of say there is this category of conduct that we need to prevent in advance and it does inevitably would, uh, have the impact of excluding certain forms of lawful protest that are in that particular way and it certainly has knock-on effects on others who decide that they won't get involved at all so yeah if you're going to parliament's going to do it it's not going to be any different in terms of its impact than a High Court judge sitting in the Chancery Division doing it. And it's and, and it's outrageous that Mr. What's his name again? Jeff somebody? Gets to effectively legislate. He gets to legislate. Radcliffe. Radcliffe gets, to, because he's got enough money, he gets to set what the law is for all of us. Now that is classically not the role of a rich individual 
to do by secret injunction. I, I object to super injunction school stuff actually because I don't think they should be secret. To the young uh, gentleman who said, what are they trying to do? This is culture war, political nonsense. Um, and they, they're probably trying to wrong foot, to go back to the previous question, they're probably trying to wrong foot Labour as well. You're on the side, you're not on the side of decent, ordinary, ordinary people, as if decent, ordinary people don't ever protest or feel like protesting, as if some of them weren't being encouraged by Mr Johnson and others to protest for Brexit just a couple of years ago. Um, and, and on the chilling effect, just very briefly, um, and, and why I disagree that the protesters have brought anything on themselves is that protesters are not in, in no protest movement in the history of the universe have they been a homogenous, uh, disciplined, organised group. There are even the suffragettes, you know, they had all sorts of rows, even in the Pankhurst family, you know, about their tactics. But legislators have a responsibility to legislate for everybody. And inevitably, there are people getting swept up into this, like journalists, for example. Charlotte Lynch, 25 years old, reporter for LBC radio station in this country on November the 8th last year went to report on the Just Stop Oil demonstrations on the M25. She wasn't on the M25. She is to the side. She is there with her insignia, with her press card, and she, the handcuffs go on, her bone is taken, she's bundled into a police van for a couple of hours, she's taken to Stevenage Police Station where she is taken down to the cells and locked up for five hours. This is only months after Sarah Everard. How did she feel? And then she's let go. No charge. Now tell me about the chilling effect. And that is a that is a that is a journalist. And she could she could have been a young lawyer going to be a legal observer on a demonstration. She could have just been somebody who, who was there and was having a look. So we legislate for everyone and we and legislation will be used by good and bad people by accident or design. That offence, by the way, that she was arrested for was called conspiracy to cause a public nuisance because some people believe that demonstrators are trying to get, and I quote, the oxygen of publicity. And journalists, of course, are giving them the oxygen of publicity. So surely they must be complicit in this public nuisance. So there's a chilling effect, not just for protesters, but for bystanders and citizens and journalists and lawyers and everybody living in, you know, a, an increasingly authoritarian environment. Thank you, Shelley. And thank, thank you to all of you. Now, we've recorded this. We're going to put it on our website probably tomorrow, maybe the day after. We will tweet it. Please retweet it. This is a conversation that lots of people should listen to, so please do. So it just leaves it to me to, to say thank you to all three of you. It's a fantastic conversation. Thank you for coming. And uh, let's... Uh, Thank <laughs> you.